All right, let's kick it off. So, um, welcome everybody to a discussion about um, remote sprints and facilitation of productivity, uh, or remoteness, I should say, facilitation and productivity. Um, we have today um, two very uh, special guests, Barbara Ruling from CEO from Book Sprints, um, and Julia Norrish, uh, who's from Book Dash. Actually, I don't know your role at um, Book Dash, Julia, your, your title. My apologies. Um, executive director, so. Executive director. Okay, so we have both CEOs here. Um, I know both projects. I was the founder of uh, Book Sprints. My name is Adam Hyde, and I've been a long time uh, adoring fan of Book Dash. Uh, incredible project um, and um, we're going to learn a little bit about both projects and then talk about um, the role of um, facilitation in productivity and um, tools uh, and techniques that have been learned through working remotely um, and to keep teams productive and this is um, with the notion of sprints um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is but you know we're hoping that some of the lessons learned from working remotely that Book Dash and Book Sprints have conducted might be generally applicable. So um, let's let's um, first of all, um, Julia, do you want to say something a little bit about yourself and um, and uh, what Book Dash is, what the process is, what it looks like, what it does? Sure. So yeah, my name's Julia, and I'm the executive director at Book Dash. Um, Bookdash is a South African based nonprofit publisher for children's books for very young children. And we, our vision is for every child to own 100 books by the age of five. And so basically, the Bookdash methodology is a response to making that possible and achieving that, that end. Um, the vision is based on research that shows book ownership is really um, beneficial for young children and also just a lot of first-hand observations around the, the huge benefits that come with owning and having easy access to books as a young child. But book ownership levels in South Africa are really low and it's affecting all sorts of problems, knock-on effects. So Bookdash had to come up with a way of creating really great books really quickly, really cost-effectively. And inspired by organizations like Book Sprints and through connections, like that, the founders developed a process for get it, gathering creative volunteers, getting them until recently all into one big room together and facilitating each team of writer, illustrator and designer to make a new fully ready to go children's book in just 12 hours. Um, and that really all the books are open license. So they, after they are made, they go onto our website and get reshared by partners they travel the world, reach all corners of the universe and get translated, all of that. And our, then in line with our, our vision, our uh, role after the books are published on our website for free is we, we generate funding for translations and printing physical books. But the, what we're really interested in talking about today is the Bookdash methodology of making great books in 12 hours. And what we hosted the first event of that in 2014 and since we've made 140 different books in that way um, the most we've ever facilitated was 12 teams working to make 12 new books in one day but of course all of that was um, at physical events and when everyone was in the same room working in real time and real space so today is really going to be really interesting to consider how we adapted that process recently in April to, to take place in the ether. So um, can you speak, um, before we move on to Barbara for an introduction to book sprints, can you speak a little bit about what the Book Dash event looks like? Um, you know, what is it if we were to walk into it? What does it look like? Um, and also, um, because it's often invisible, what is the role of the facilitator or facilitators in, this, in, the, in the environment? So if you walked into a book dash happening, say around lunchtime, you would see um, however many teams we have, each working around a desk together, probably with their computers and everything that they've lugged um, to the event venue to make it possible to create a book in 12 hours. Um, you'll, you'll see each team, as I said, has a writer, an illustrator, and a designer, and they are in constant communication around um, 
what's happening next following the flat plan that we ask people to do in the beginning of the day, which is really the roadmap for the entire book. Probably a little bit jittery wondering when the facilitators, these invisible people, are going to come around again because we check on the each team every 40 minutes they need to have moved on to another double page spread or, or illustration spread um, of the book. And but I think the thing that's really important in the physical events and will be important for this discussion later is the, the energy is really palpable. So everyone knows and everyone can see just by looking up and looking around that there is an intense amount of productivity going on. Everyone's working towards the same goal, which is to have a finished book to present at the show and tell session at half past eight that evening. And so there's, there's a sense of, of stress, but a kind of productive stress and united um, towards this goal. And the facilitators on the day are kind of staying out of the way as much as possible um, until required to check in with the teams. By lunchtime, we've done our briefings and everyone knows what they need to get on with. And then throughout the day, there are a few breakaway sessions. For instance, the writers will all meet after lunch to read through their stories that should be almost word perfect by then, but then um, they can give a few um, inputs and tweaks and things like that. Whereas the majority of the day, the teams are working with, within their teams, but in a bigger space of, of the whole event, but working really directly with their writer, writer, illustrator and designer and the editor who is a roving participant. Um, so yeah, that, I don't know if that gives a kind of feel for, for what's taking place at a book dash and that goes on for the whole 12 hours with facilitators checking in every 40 minutes with teams and coming up with you know, action plans or, or helping the teams think about how they can pick up the pace or um, if, if we notice um, issues, then we'll deal with those. But our main job on the day is to support the teams because an essential part of a book dash that sometimes um, not everyone realizes is that everyone there on the day is a volunteer, but they are a creative professional in their own right in the role that they are playing on the day. So they either write for a living or they illustrate for a living or they design for a living or edit. So we are really there to have make sure that everyone understands the goal for the day, understands their role in achieving that goal and to support them if they need help achieving that. Um, yeah. and, and I believe you have photos on the book dash site, right? And lots of documentation. Do, do, um, do you want to give out the URL for people to check it out? Yeah, sure. So the book dash model itself for creating books in 12 hours is, um, is also open licensed and that can be accessed as well as all the books at bookdash.org. One word. Um, I can put it in the chat as well. And so there, there are photos from the day, each day, each book dash event, we have a little video and some comments. Thanks, Barbara. And um, you can see the books that were made. Uh, what, what was I saying? Yeah, but also if you would like to experiment with piloting a book dash event, there's a full documentation of the processes um, that we follow, the outline for the day, the briefings for the, the, the creatives, how to find and select your creatives, everything like that. Uh, we have done our best to document so that other people can, can use and adapt the model as, as suits them. And we have seen at least five kind of iterations that we know of or replications of the book dash model, sometimes hosted over two days, sometimes with fewer teams. We always suggest people begin with fewer teams just to, the first book dash uh, had just two teams. So, you know, live and learn. Um, but we really want this, this approach to addressing a certain part of the literacy crisis and in a very open access, quick, cost-effective way to be replicated around the world. Right. And just so, because I, um, I know people don't often, it, it's very hard to believe, but just to make it very concrete, you get a bunch of people together in a room um, and you set up, um, you set them up in teams of a writer, illustrator and designer, teams of three. They bring up all their own equipment they're all volunteers and at the end of 12 hours each of the teams has produced a fully written illustrated and designed book ready for publication exactly yeah yeah 
it, it's and sometimes nice to just say it so um, concretely because I think it's it's very hard to to believe if if you if you you know if you haven't been part of it. Do, do you find people have difficulty believing that this is possible? Yeah, all the time. They they always want to know what's the catch. Um, yeah. And I think obviously we live and learn and tweak the model and improve it every time. And our kind of what we call completion rate has improved over the years because we've done book dash events now 14 times. So we, we are quite certain and can offer a, a large degree of certainty that all the books will be finished by eight o'clock that evening um, yeah. and, and ready to be published. Yeah, and I guess that's part of it. That's uh, that pressure. That's um, it's a really beautiful project. Um, just one last question before we move on to um, to Barbara. Um, people hearing that it's um, it's very fast might think, oh well, okay, you can make something in twelve hours. But do you want to speak to something about the quality argument? Like, oh, they must be low quality. Yeah, sure. Um... We have been, I think ourselves as publishers and people that have loved books and experienced books and either sold books or published books for however many years, we are always humbled by the quality that is produced by these creatives within 12 hours, volunteers or not. The, the, and actually sometimes we think it's, it's heightened by the fact that they're volunteering and are not motivated by, by money um, or compensation other than doing something amazing for the world. The, but uh, like in addition to our thinking the books are amazing and great, the, the people that reuse the books and reshare them on their digital platforms. So just for example, we have about 50 that we know of. Again, people don't need to tell us if they're, the open license is so open that people can use the books without letting us know, although most people do. The books are used on over 50 platforms around the world and the number of downloads and comments and reviews and feedback that the books get speaks to the quality that we're producing. Um, something that I like to reference sometimes is that someone wanted to feature, wanted to create a platform for open licensed children's books. And they did a sweep of the web of people offering the, the type of content that they were looking for and they decided on 500 books from looking over the all of the internet um, on open license children's books and 140 of those were book dash books so wow. um, <laughs> yeah so the the quality of the books that the creators produce and that our model facilitates the production of is is something that is highlighted time and time again the books have won awards um last year we had the open publishing award they've also won awards for best early childhood development uh, publication in south africa the the model itself has won awards for innovation and um you know uh, social impact in in developing countries so the the yeah the kind of next level of disbelief is the quality of what is created and not mm -hmm. only that something is created. The books are also sold uh, recently. We've um, entered into a more formal uh, agreement with booksellers in the country. There was such a demand for, for books that we were producing for people to buy the books because normally the books that we work with partners to print and distribute the books to be given to children and families for free within reading promotion and literacy promotion projects. But there was such a demand from the general public to be able to purchase the books for themselves that we, the books are now sold in bookstores across the country and those sales subsidize donations to people that can't afford it. So apart from kind of lofty awards and, and you know, panels saying that the books are great, the, mm. the public has also spoken in that way, which is more heartening probably. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, truly a, a remarkable. Uh, I'm just seeing how little light there is and where I am right now. It's, my light just went off. It's 3 a.m. in the morning or something. It's a remarkable, remarkable <laughs> um, project. And, um, and I believe some of the co-founders will be um, talking later on in the fireside chat later on today. Um, thank you, Julia. Just to recap, that was Julia Norris from uh, Book Dash. Uh, you can check out Book Dash, bookdash.org. We're talking about remote facilitation, um, productivity, and sprints. 
Um, and um, Barbara, could you say something about um, about uh, book sprints? And while you do so, I'm going to turn on the light so I don't look like I'm in a cave. So I will be <laughs> back while you talk. Sure. So um, at Book Sprints, we facilitate five-day sprints where uh, we guide a group of experts through a process from concepting, structuring, writing, revising, editing, and producing a book. So um, not at the end of 12 hours like you do at Book Dash, but at the end of five times 12 hours, um, we have a, a produced a book that is um, uh, written by five to 15 experts on the topic. It's been revised by as many, so it's uh, practically peer reviewed. Uh, it's illustrated, it's copy edited, and it's designed and, and ready to be published. Um, so uh, this is a service that we offer to um, uh, academics, to uh, international organizations, governmental organizations, to companies, um, consultancies, uh, a lot of software companies, and um, they bring their experts on a topic. It's often knowledge that is very um, implicit, very distributed amongst uh, a lot of different heads in the same, um, either in the same organization or across different organizations. Um, often uh, knowledge that hasn't really been written down in that way and that has to be brought out by collaboration and by uh, a lot of conversations and, and by really sort of bringing in different perspectives, um, for example, uh, the interdisciplinary um, projects or um, uh, projects that have been um, very practical or um, been based on uh, many years of, of research but haven't really been sort of um, uh, boiled down to, to that one book, that one sort of handbook or um, manual or um, um, uh, teaching material. Um, so we bring in uh, a trained facilitator who guides the group through that process and we have a book production team working in the background on the illustrations and the design and um, the copy editing and um, we work with Editoria which is um, a uh, collaborative writing and rapid book production platform also um, open source uh, developed by the Coco Foundation um, that really sort of helps helps the process, but the main thing is is the facilitation sort of getting all the obstacles out of the way that we have when we're writing when we write individually we have that in a critic we have a writer's block we have all these sort of um, distractions that keep us from being productive um, when we work collaboratively often conversations are um, not on point we lose the moment when we actually already had consensus and go back in a circle in a loop. Um, we, we question ourselves, we don't really sort of take the next step. We send um, long word documents back and forth with track changes and so on. So by identifying all of these obstacles and really having a facilitator who can um, make sure that the environment is correct, the group of people is correct, everybody in the room can be um, with their specific work style and with their specific uh, personality as productive as possible, the conversations can be as constructive as possible, um, we get this enormous uh, productivity and, and efficiency. I think very similar to, uh, Julia, what you described at Book Dash, you have really this uh, humming, buzzing beehive of, of people being um, extremely motivated, extremely energized, uh, working towards that um, goal and having that very fixed deadline, like there has to be this book has to be ready to be published by the end of day five in our case. Um, just creates so much motivation and a book is still such a culturally valued object that it really um, gets everyone on board on, on, on working towards that. And I think in, in the case of uh, book sprints where we do uh, non-fiction books with experts, uh, we've done one accidental fiction book, but usually they're non-fiction. <laughs> Um, it's, it's also quite different from other sort of knowledge exchange formats, workshops, conferences, and so on, in the sense that people co-author the book. It's really collaboratively written. It's not an edited volume with different authors for different parts of the book. It's, it, it will be edited, revised by everybody, um, and all the names are going to be on the um, cover. Often they choose open licenses, but it depends on, our, on the people we work with. But the fact that they co-author this book really means that 
you can't like sit back and quietly disagree as you might do at a conference. You really have to work through all the differences. So um, the, the learning, the exchange and the creation of new ideas um, is, is immense. So the, at the end of the five days, the, the group has this artifact, which is the book, which they can sort of carry forward and, and share with a wider audience. But they also really went through this intense experience of, of learning and exchange and, and community building essentially so sorry Barbara you were going to say something else nope. no okay so can you also ex um if you were to walk into a book sprint room you know uh, at various times throughout the process what does it what does it look like um so there would be lots of sticky notes everywhere on the walls drawings on whiteboards any piece of paper any material that you have is used um, there are moments where the entire group of the 10 or so experts are uh, together and being guided through a, a, a conversation, but in many moments there would be small groups, two or three people working on different chapters together, um, the facilitator walking around, making sure that sort of all these obstacles are out of the way, making sure everyone's really productive, keeping time, um, and at the same time coordinating the, the book production team in the background that works remotely. Um, any anything that comes up often people will draw a quick illustration on a napkin and that will go to our illustrators and they will turn it into um, a beautiful diagram send that back that's also very iterative so there's also a lot of back and forth um, then when the group of writers finishes a day of writing our copy editors who are in different time zones in South Africa and New Zealand for example will take over and um, do a day of uh, day shift night shift of cleaning up the text and giving feedback to the writers for the next day to work on um, there's also times when it's very quiet and everyone is very concentrated sometimes also working alone for a couple of hours really just writing you just hear the sound of the typewriters um, but there's a lot of conversations we say that the writing is maybe only a, a third of the time and maybe a third of the time is spent on on discussing the concept the structure restructuring it um, generating new ideas and then uh, a big third of the time is spent on, on the revisions the editing and there's also a lot of conversations around that really making sure that um, it's readable there's no jargon uh, there's a red thread the, the reader is really guided through the reader journey through the book um, so that's also very very discussion based so just to just for the um, the viewers once again concretely a bunch of people come to you they want to write a book on a certain topic. Um, they have nothing other than the title. And then from uh, over the period of five days, you completely produce a publish it, publish a book, a publishable book. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's right. So, and um, do you also find similarly that people don't believe that this is possible? Yeah, all the time. It's, it's a very hard sell. Um, people have to experience it to believe it. Uh, but luckily we do find um, some explorers all the time who are willing to uh, convince a group to to do it and once they've been through it they really um, convert it. it it really works it has worked every single time we've always made it happen um, and uh, yeah once you've seen it you believe it but it's very hard to explain to someone who who hasn't seen it and what about the um, the quality argument for book sprints you know um, how many uh, it's easy to think wow well, but people in the room for five days, you know, could give them Google Docs, just go for it. I mean, they'll produce something. Um, what about the, what about the quality is, uh, can you speak to the quality of the book and their effectiveness? Yeah, our, our main standard is that we say whatever the group sets uh, themselves as the goal, that is what we have to achieve. So if the group says like, this has to be for master students, it has to be easy enough to understand, um, it has to cover all of these topics and it has to achieve this and this and this goal. Um, and then at the end of the five days, they say, yes, this is what we achieved. Um, that is sort of our standard. Uh, we have books that have been um, downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, have been translated into more than 11 languages uh, that are used for training materials all over the world. Um, they end up on ministers' uh, desks, um, yeah, but, but numbers only are a small part of the story because some of the topics are very niche. So sometimes a book reaches a thousand people, but they're exactly the thousand people that have to read this book. And, and um, it's, it's a huge success for the organization who wrote it. 
Um, so we always try to follow up and see what happens to the book and, and the groups are extremely happy with it and it serves the goal that they wanted to serve. Um, then that means for us that we, we, we reach the quality that we need to reach. And they're also often um, published by more traditional uh, publishing houses. We just had a book in um, Cambridge University Press, for example. Um, so yeah, we are, we are very happy mm -hmm. with the quality. Great. Um, excellent. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, about productivity um, and, and real space productivity when it comes to sprints, because these are two very special environments, right? And just as a framing, you may wish to disagree with it, I would suggest there's possibly three things to think about um, that we could talk about. One is the tooling, the other one is, um, is the moment, and the other one is facilitation, right? Seems that these three things are kind of the important ingredients. Um, so um, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the tooling first of all. Like, how important to each of your processes is the tooling? Uh, can you say just let's keep this brief? Um, Julia, can you say something about what other tools that you use? You know, the softwares, any other tools that you would use, including uh, whiteboards or whatever, and and how important are those? And and how much of the magic? are those tools? Yeah, um, so let me just think. <laughs> <laughs> the, the tools are obviously incredibly important. As Barbara said, and I heard her talk about constant communication, constant discussion. And so when you're in a physical space, the, the tools are supporting that ability to just make decisions really, really quickly. Um, obviously, so, so Bookdash uses InDesign and, and publishing tools like that that we provide to each um, team. And that really structures what they need to achieve. We've provided them a template. So all our books are um, the same length, the same specs and everything. And that also helps them work fast because they don't have to make decisions around those kind of things. They just have to work within the template we provide them. And then tools like sharing between uh, creatives we transfer like physically actually hardware like flash drives normally everything is done on a flash drive that also mm -hmm. facilitates the production um, the tools became more important on, in the virtual uh, situation yeah, we'll come was, to that well, yeah okay we'll, okay so if we're just thinking about physical um to, so, like simple tools like paper and pencil as barbara was saying a lot of it happens like that um yeah. but yeah, yeah they they really provide the channel for which uh, creators can come up with a with a book and a plan and then and then execute that plan on the day right barbara do you want to say something about oh and uh, just sorry julia so how much of that if someone was, was to ask you and i know it's a ridiculous question but book dash is magic how much of the magic in the real space um environment is the tools the software the you know sure Forty percent. Forty percent. Interesting. Um, Julia, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, Julia, Barbara. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm interested in this contrast. Um, uh, Barbara, do you want to speak something about the tooling and? Um, yeah, I think I think forty percent is a good guess. Um, we always say even without any tools, and which is like pen and paper, we would still make something happen but the tools uh, facilitated incredibly. Um, so yeah, Editoria is really sort of what makes uh, the book production happen. It, it shapes the whole writing experience for everybody. Um, whiteboards, paper, any visualization tool is incredibly important. Sticky notes, I don't think we could do anything without sticky notes. Um, those kind of tools are now in, in the remote sprints that we've been doing, the selection of tools has been really, really in the foreground. Um, then for our illustrators, they use Figma, which is an amazing collaborative online um, illustration tool, uh, which is great. So uh, tools really shape the, the whole process. They um, make everything a lot faster, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. slower. <laughs> um, but I think more important than the tools is, are the people. I think the, the technology does not work without the people. I think it's sometimes, um, especially when we work with software companies, they kind of think, oh, like what, what you bring here is actually this tool. And now we just like go and fill in the, the blanks. Um, but without having uh, the right group of people and the right facilitation method, I think the tool in itself, like no tool in itself makes um, any kind of magic happen. 
yeah i think that's ex that's exactly it there's the tools the facilitation and then the, the people you've got in the room so so let's talk about it's interesting you have a consensus about it's very interesting about the sort of the mix of the tooling um and, and its importance um let's talk about the moment right so you know you you create this special moment this environment um and uh where people can collaborate and without talking about the facilitation yet um barbara would you like to speak something about you know what that moment feels like to people and, and whether this is part this generates engagement and how important that is to the process the facilitation uh sorry the you know the moment of having the room having this this mission uh you know you created a um uh, this bubble for people you know how, how important is all that sort of cultural component without talking about the facilitation how you get there how important mm -hmm. is that to the, the mm -hmm. process uh, I, I think it's incredibly important uh, before we now did the first remote sprints we used to swear by this real space collaboration and really say the best friends are the ones where you go to a little house in the countryside um, no distractions everyone takes off their shoes or even like works in their pajamas uh, shares meals together, sleeps in the same building, really goes on to this um, field trip basically um, where you have the luxury of spending so much time with your colleagues and really focusing on this one project, very different from our sort of day-to-day -day life where we are so fragmented um, and working on this on this uh, very tangible outcome. I think uh, yeah that that moment is um, a lot of fun it's super energizing and it, it really makes makes a lot a big part of the magic julia yeah exactly so what you're calling the moment we call the magic and and same word it's that um intangible feeling of of everyone being together and and working towards a united goal and we we also create that a huge part of our job not as the facilitators but as the kind of hosts of this space um that we get everyone to, you know, we have this music and this bunting and this, you know, the food and this wine and and um, and our energy on the day. Often, we'll call ourselves cheerleaders as much as facilitators. So our energy on the day is really adding to that, that um, setting the tone for the day as well. So we do very strategically think about how to create that magic um, and bring everyone into the space, and then they bring their own magic. They kind of rise to the occasion. I think is what we see. So moving on to facilitation, um, what, what role, what, what is facilitation to you, um, each of you, and what role does that play in your process? Julia, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, so I mean, I think facilitation obviously takes many forms depending on what you're trying to achieve. But at the end of the day, you are trying to get the, the people taking part in whatever event it is, um, whether there's a tangible goal or a kind of theoretical conceptual goal, you're trying to extract as much of or empower them as much as possible to achieve that goal. And I, I really like what Barbara, the terminology she uses around removing obstacles. I hadn't thought about it necessarily in, in that, those terms before. So your job as a facilitator, I, I always think that, especially as book dash facilitators, 80% of our work is done beforehand because we've had to think of everything that could or might go wrong, that might slow down the process and know, either know how to deal with it if it happens or already have dealt with it and that no one sees before the event takes place. Um, so much of the thinking of facilitation has happened that way. And then in the kind of real-time facilitation to, yeah, to bring out everyone's best and, um, and to also when you're doing rapid facilitation is to keep reminding people of that goal and identifying anything that might slow slow you down on the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Barbara? Oh, I think you're muted, Barbara. Okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the facilitation is, is everything. It's extremely powerful. And I like what you said about uh, having it sort of being invisible. I think the more invisible it is, the better it is working. Uh, a lot of things you had, you have already removed the obstacles so people don't even know they ever existed. Um, it's, in, in our case, it's uh, extremely important being an uh, external facilitator. We are not invested in the book topic at all and the outcome of the book. We don't own any of the 
a book that that comes out in the end so the group can really trust us in moments of disagreements um, or also just uh, personal tensions or whatever they can really trust the facilitator to to act in the best interest of the group and the project um, we sometimes say it's a little bit different from other kinds of facilitation in the sense that it's so production oriented. So it's not just about everybody having a great experience. It's also about getting, achieving the goal, having a book at the end of the, of the day. So it's a little bit of both. You have to make sure that all the um, participants are, are happy and, and can be as productive as they can be. But at the same time, um, you know, it's not, it's not just about singing Kumbaya, there is sort of a real goal to, to be achieved and keeping everybody on track and making sure that that, that, has, that, that is happening um, is, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's really good to have an external facilitator who can take care of that so people don't constantly have to wonder about the bigger picture and can really focus on the small tasks at hand, whereas um, somebody is working in the background and making sure that everything gets done in the right time, in the right moment, and nothing sort of like falls off the table. So um, for those who just tuned in, <laughs> we're talking about um, uh, sprints, just been doing a summary of um, what a book sprint and a, what um, a book dash looks like. Uh, we have with us Barbara Rulin, CEO of Book Sprints, and uh, Julia Norrish as the Executive Director of Book Dash. Um, and so we framed this kind of what these events look like, the important ingredients of it, at least some of them. Um, going forward, you both experimented with virtual book sprints. So let's have a conversation about what you learned through that process, because I think this might be interesting to um, many publishers um, uh, or those that now have to find themselves working in knowledge production with remote teams, because both of you, I think, are producing knowledge right in a, in a collaborative very collaborative sense you're used to very immersive real space environments but now because of the pandemic you've had to move remotely so you know what what are the some of the uh, the difficulties and challenges that you both found um, um, in, in in these new processes yeah, I, I, just... <laughs> I can start um and i think there'll also more will come out as we talk but yeah, we decided to, we were basically faced with, do we wait until we uh, are able to recreate a book dash um, in a physical space or do we kind of bite the bullet and test out the virtual, virtual notion? And I think the first thing was for us to, to realize what were the limitations and what were the opportunities around doing it like this. So obviously there's some opportunities in that people could, our, our virtual book dash that we had in April, um people were working from all over the country which is not something that's normally possible to, uh, together unless we physically flew them down and budgets don't allow for that so that was a great opportunity that we identified first up and then the limitations we we knew we've only got 12 hours with these people so there's no not a lot of time for kind of slow um seeping in of how this works and, and working towards the goal so, and, and what the model is. So we took the decision to only work with um, participants that had done a book dash before and had experienced, you know, the kind of real, real thing for lack of a better term. And so that they knew what they were aiming to replicate or adapt. And um, so that for us was a, quite a big limitation, although we do have a network of 350 creators to, to choose from who've done the um, events and some have done multiple events and that was a, a pro in our eyes as well. We also chose to just start with three teams and work with three, three books instead of 10, which is a, a huge reduction on the kind of productivity of the 12 hours if you, if you um, were to think of what gets, what gets produced. And in adapting the process, we were very glad that we decided to do that and we actually don't think that the virtual um, model would allow for that many more teams than, than the three that we piloted with, just because of the general uh, limitations of a virtual space, the difficulties in facilitating in a, in a kind of conscious way. Uh, it was much trickier. You can't read body language. You have to f actually kind of check in with everyone um, and stop production and you know, ask them how they're going. So apart from using our facilitators a little bit more strategically, which we could do, we could split up in a, in, in a better way, but we don't foresee 
that we could produce more than five, mm. five or six books ever in a virtual book day. Right. So that's interesting. So, so the, the facilitator, the invisible facilitator, suddenly within a remote environment actually becomes a lot more visible. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. And, um, and I was just going to say, sorry, and, and in a remote space, because you, because you don't have these, what we call invisible signs, but are actually visible, black body language and facial expressions and, and things like that, or even just seeing if someone's even at their desk or not. <laughs> um, the all communication becomes a lot more conscious. Um, and that, in some ways, is great. You've got a better record of how decisions were made and what happened. And in some ways, it takes a lot of the, the magic and the making decisions on the fly um, out of the process. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, um, um, how do you keep people in the moment? How do you keep them engaged in that, uh, in that situation? Yeah. So in this case, I think the tool, the selection of the tool became really important. You know, in, in a physical book dash, the main tool is the, the, not the main tool, but the overarching tool is the venue, this physical space that we're all in. Um, and we needed to recreate that. We chose to try and recreate and stick to the model as much as possible and adapt where needed. So we ran through our um, agenda for the day, which is very strictly, you know, planned down to every 10 minutes and we said okay what needs to be adapted and what can go ahead as as planned um and uh, yeah so when we were thinking about the tool and what it needed to allow for it needed to allow for everyone to be in the same space as well as everyone to have those kind of breakaway spaces and it needed to allow for video chats it needed to allow for um collaborative tools like for the flat planning and the kind of planning of the book process and so I spent a lot of time, and I, if anyone is thinking about uh, hosting any kind of remote book production or, or general uh, rapid production of things, I would really recommend like investigating as much time as allows, which tool is going to best suit your requirements and, and being clear about your requirements on the day. So yeah, we ended up using uh, Microsoft Teams actually that allows for, for different chat rooms and all the things that we needed. Um, and we made sure that everyone, we also had a WhatsApp group, which we don't normally do, but I, that was like allowed for kind of sharing um, silly photos and that kind of thing to be shared. And we, we thought a lot about how to recreate that magic. So we had a general room in the team's within the team's platform, in addition to everyone, each team having their own room where they could, you know, get on with their work in between check-ins. Um, but we did find as well, you know, we, we thought that there would be more demand from the creatives to, to join as a full cohort of, there were about 20 of us in total, um, to create that sense of unity and that sense of working together. But th we didn't actually need that as much as we, we had envisioned. Uh, a lot of the comments and the feedback that we got from the creatives who took part was that the magic is, is almost implicitly there, they know that other people are working with them and the magic is working in, within the smaller team and, and producing something amazing for the end of the day. And so by meeting everyone in the beginning, plus a check-in around lunchtime, and then seeing what the other teams have produced at eight o'clock and sharing, so we do a kind of physical show and tell read through, um, and for the virtual event that allowed us to stream it to YouTube Live, which was also another opportunity that the virtual nature gave. Um, that was enough. That is the magic of the book dash, I think. Um, plus the facilitators checking in. That's interesting. So th there's a certain amount of. Um, it sounds to me that the intimacy on the larger group didn't um, gel as much, from what I'm hearing, what you're saying. But it was like the small groups they found in a remote environment they could create intimacy and a working um, momentum in small uh, action groups. Would that be yeah. accurate? Yeah, and I think we as facilitators, we're, we're used to having oversight of the full event. And so that was front of mind for us when we wanted to, to move virtually. But I think perhaps we didn't realize that there aren't that many moments for the, the creatives working in, in the smaller teams that they actually, apart from seeing, physically seeing everyone, um, that mm -hmm. they interact with anyone anyway. So that intimacy of the smaller group was maintained. Um, and that's is the majority of what they experience in the day as well. And I guess these are autonomous huddles as well, right? They can make their own decisions and they're just sort of being propelled along by the clock and by 
the check-ins and stuff. So is that, are, they, are they mechanisms also that are still powerful and useful, the check-ins by the facilitator just to keep it going? Yeah, otherwise I can tell you that if we didn't check in with our teams, we probably wouldn't have any books on our website at the moment. Right, right. Um, because they've got all the skills, but exactly what Barbara was saying, they need, um, they need someone to tell them when it's, because we're working with, you know, creative people and, and usually perfectionists. So we need someone to tell them when, you know, this is good enough. It's 95% perfect. Move on to the next spread. Otherwise you're not going to finish. You can come back and tweak it if you want to, if there's time, there almost never is. Um, and at the end of the day, everyone is much happier with a 95% perfect completed book than one perfect spread. So we actually, um, have to be, well, we, are, we, I think what we're really good at at BookDash as facilitators is recognizing how much a team needs to be pushed along and when they're better at being left and they're going at the, at the pace that they will finish. But we do, even if we don't um, physically tell a team to move on, we're still tracking them behind the scenes and knowing, um, okay, fine, we're giving them an extra hour. Let's see what they do in the next hour. And um, if they're still behind, then we, we need to have a sterner <laughs> conversation. So um, it's an unfair question, but in the, in the virtual environment, um, you know, what would you break down, you know, in terms of the tooling, the sort of the moment and the facilitation, what would, is the percentages change or do you feel it's just, it's, it's remains the same as just slightly different? Yeah, I think that's interesting. I do think that in the virtual, the, the tooling probably became, more important because the tooling is what's facilitating the communication. Um, in a in a physical space, we can all talk to each other in real time; it's no problem. But if you choose if you choose a tool that doesn't easily facilitate that communication because it's constant, so people are always it's what do you think of this color red? Do you think um, Mercedes' parents should be here? There, you know, it's like we're always talking about what's going on. Um, deciding color palettes and it's so collaborative I really like what Barbara said around um, the co-authors and everyone going on the, the cover page as as equal weighted authors because at a book dash you cannot distinguish really between the role of the designer and the illustrator and then you know sometimes the writer depending on sometimes the writer can illustrate at, at our virtual book dash um, the writer is a you know very accomplished illustrator and he was coloring in drawings throughout the day once the words were finished so there's no those boundaries are really um dissolved in a, in a book dash environment and if that if the tool that you choose to host the virtual event doesn't allow for that communication i think um it's it would have a greater effect than, mm -hmm. than in the physical space um, but at the same time you can choose the best tool and you can have creators that are just not able to to complete the task at hand and you still end up with no book so so the, the the moment is still important it changes a bit the texture of it changes it works better in small teams the tooling is very important because it becomes the main vehicle for communication so there's an increased importance there but also the facilitation is still critical but it changes because you're more um deliberate about it i guess would that be accurate? Yeah, more deliberate. And we realized that facilitation would be constrained um, because, of, because of hosting it virtually. And so mm -hmm. the, the importance of the pre-knowledge of the model became important to us, hence why we only chose the people that right. didn't. Interesting. So, so part of the moment, the, the magic of the cultural bubble is created by inheritance from previous events. Uh, but what's interesting about this, it sounds like the, I mean, you have the tools and you have the people. It sounds like there was more work for facilitators because you went from 15 to three books. Would that be accurate? There's more work for the facilitator in that, or is that some other reason why you sort of scaled down? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think stuff just takes longer and then it, all group activities to, in order to create that moment, we wanted, we would never normally introduce, have everyone introduce themselves. That would take forever with 50 people. Um, but we wanted, that was one of the ways we said we need to do that in the virtual space. So that added on time in the morning. That's, um, you know, and the more teams we had, the longer that would add on. And <laughs> every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes. Oh, it, okay. it, 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 it. So, so things like that, yeah. Um, 
even the read through at the end of the day, that just took longer. So we were aware yeah. around the time constraints as well as the increased facilitation. Interesting. That's very interesting. Barbara, how about you? What's your experience with um, transferring to virtual sprints? I think you're muted again. <laughs> See, that's good practice. You mute yourself. One of the things we learned. <laughs> right. um, it, it was really interesting for us. We did two virtual book sprints now. And after for years saying um, it has to be real space collaboration, the intensity is, is so uh, strong in a book sprint. We can't emulate that online. Um, we now actually saw a little bit of the opposite, uh, seeing that everyone is now working remotely. Um, we are way ahead of the game in the in the sense that we already know about the power of facilitation you can't just put a group of people in a room and think they will um magically be uh productive and focused and and um and there is of course this may happen but it may also very much not happen and we've all been in so many meetings that never had any outcome and never ended and and um in that sense, we already knew about, we already know how to facilitate a group uh, to work together and we could transfer that to, to the virtual space. And um, we also realized while we always said that our participants, so the writers, uh, cannot be um, collaborating virtually, we have always worked remotely with our own book production team. So this has already always been our internal uh, way of working. So a lot of that we could actually transfer. Um, the mix of tools is, is critical, um, having chat channels, but then also video chat, having the right tools, like uh, the one I talked about uh, earlier, Figma is this amazing um, illustration tool that is also completely browser-based. So you can see each other working on, you can comment on an illustration and say, oh, can you change this color here? And you see the illustrator changing it on the spot, like these kind of things you could just sort of transfer into into our virtual book sprints. Um, but of course, there are uh, challenges, a, a lot of them. Uh, I think we had some of similar experiences or also in the planning, we made similar choices that, as Julia described for BookDash. Um, we said smaller teams, the teams have to be smaller. It didn't actually happen. The, the first team we worked with was bigger than what we usually recommend. And this is one of the interesting learnings that we found that um, the selection of participants, we usually say no more than 15. If we have more than 15 people working on a book, it actually becomes less productive. Um, there's less trust in the group. There's, the communication doesn't flow as easily. Um, so there's a selection process that the organizer does and flying people in or, or actually bringing people together in a real space, there is that very real logistical problem setting up an online meeting and then limiting the number of participants is very difficult because technically anyone in the team can can participate so we actually ended up having a bigger group than um than we recommend and uh we had to be very very structured um also I, a lot of the things that julia describes like usually the facilitation is a lot more organic the facilitator feels the room, you see what is happening, you see if somebody is unhappy or not sitting at their desk, no? Um, the check-ins are sort of, they just kind of happen in like informal conversations. In, a, in an on-site book sprint, we have maybe one or two formal check-ins with the whole group in a day. Um, in the virtual sprint, we did these, we forced these like every three hours, even though people were often like, oh, can we just continue writing? But it's like, no, 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 you have to, like the team has to know where you are. Everyone has to have a feeling for how the other parts of the book are, are progressing. We as facilitators have to know because we can't just sort of like look over your shoulder as easily. Um, but also just for everyone else to sort of have that, that, that progress report and really like bringing um, important questions into the plenary to discuss and so on. So making sure that, you know, no one is stopped at a point and can't move on. Um, so yeah, it has to be a lot more structured. Um, the facilitation is less invisible, like you're saying. We, we used, for example, with the first group, we used um, different breakout groups uh, in, in, in sort of different chat rooms. And every time you join one of those rooms, you're like, boom, Barbara's in the room, you know? And everyone's like, what's happening? I'm like, no, just listening, never mind me, you know? <laughs> In a, in a room, I can just sort of kind of like walk around and I listen into a lot of conversations and I may like give 
some little guidance here or there without even making a bit, big thing out of it, no? And in online, it's every, every time it's very much an announcement, no? It's like, I'm here now, like, give me a progress report. I'll tell you what to do next. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the really interesting things that also came out of it is um, trust is very different. Um, but also in a positive way, I learned to trust the group a lot more. I think in, in, in a real space, I feel much more in control as a facilitator. Like you said, Julia, if somebody's not sitting at their desk, I can like walk outside of the building and find the person, ask them what's going on and like, what do you need? Like, how can I make you get back to work? No? Uh, online, if a person locks off, there's literally nothing I can do. No? So I have to trust a lot more that people are committed. We spend a lot more time explaining how important the commitment is because it is also a lot easier working from home. There are a lot of distractions, but it also just feels a lot more natural to sort of come and go no? in, a, in a virtual meeting, um, in a room, in a real space that it, it's, a, it's a much bigger statement. No, I'm leaving the room. Um, so we spend a lot more time sort of in the preparations, explaining everybody how important um, the commitment to, to the time is, how interdependent all the different participants are, um, how much of a gap somebody leaves. Of course, if you have to take care of your pet or your, your child quickly, that's, that's fine, but sort of, you know, just um, being there for part of the day, but then disappearing um, really leaves a gap. And usually we don't have to, we don't, we don't explain too much about the method itself. We usually just tell people to trust the method and then we'll guide them through the process. And in the virtual book sprint, um, we find ourselves explaining much more the reasoning behind the different uh, steps uh, um, um, that we do to get people sort of on board because we have to get their, their trust, but we also have to trust them a lot more. Interesting. Um, so the moment, the moment is more explicit in this notion, uh, you, sort of the bubble is much more explicit, much more visible. Yeah, I, th I think we, yeah, I think we visualize a lot more. Um, also, I think Julia, you also said it, uh, the, uh, the communication has to be a lot more explicit. Decisions that are taken, we write everything down. We have sort of a decision board. Uh, we used um, mural or mural or different tools to, for brainstorming. And then we really visualize all of the decisions. So we can keep going back to it and say like, here, this is what we discussed on day one. It's written here. We agreed on mm -hmm. this. Um, mm -hmm. We do a shared agreement on, on uh, rules of interaction, no? like muting yourself, all of these kind of things. But we also gather everyone's experiences, like what do you think makes a good meeting? And we write it all down. We brainstorm mm -hmm. it and we have it somewhere visual visualized. Um, so yeah, a lot of things are a lot more explicit. Um, but that's also great. Like, like you said, Julia, it's also really great being forced to, to, um, to do that. No, a lot of the things that we think, oh, they're just organically happening and we just kind of make them implicit. It's also nice to be forced to be a little bit more explicit about them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. listen to you both. Oh, sorry, you go, Julia. No, I was just going to say the one thing I, that I learned is that for the last couple of book dashes, I'd say three or four, we haven't learned as much as we were learning in the beginning. Um, you know, we've kind of thought, oh, we, we got this down now. And then with everything needing to be explicit, it did identify or, or um, highlight a couple gaps in the model, which would, I thought was great and really humbling. Um, things that would normally just get decided as they go, you know, we're now in writing. It's like, oh, what, like, what is our um, stance on inverted commas? Do we use it? What's our style guide? Things like that. And it, it, I think that was actually really enjoyable about the process is to really find those tiny gaps in the model that are still there um, and, and address them. So, so it sounds to me like, it, listen to you both, there's a kind of three things that I, I, I think maybe three, um, take away about working remotely. Um, one, it seems that um, the tooling becomes critical because it's part of the environment. It's not just something that you pick up and use. It's actually the thing that enables you to um, collaborate with your colleagues. So, uh, and the nature of that is um, there are, you know, we all think maybe all video conferences um, softwares are the same, but they're not, right? And they need to be explored very carefully to be able to select the right one for your team uh, to create that nuance of working that they require. Um, 
the other one, it seems to me that the, um, the cultural context, and this would be true of any office as well, an office has a certain cultural context that's generated by the people in there and, um, and the presence of those people and the, and the managers, which might be shapers or other people. And it sounds to me in the, in the, in the virtual environment from the sprints, you have to be more explicit about it. You have to really spell out what the rules are. And these are the rules and you know, this is how it's gonna roll. Um, and, and the other thing, it seems to me like the facilitation works over time. You, you both sound like you're working a lot harder and you also both sound like you're making a lot more, everything's more, way more explicit. That's four things. <laughs> um, the, the communication's more explicit, the, the expectations are more explicit, um, the decisions are more explicit. Um, would that be a fair summary of your both, uh, from you both? And do you think, are there other things that you would add or, or um, detract from, from those points? I think it's a good summary. I would um, say one last thing about the tools. I think in on-site uh, sprints, our main tools are the actual space and our actual communication as our voices. So um, of course those t tools are equally important, but it, when they come mediated through technology, yeah, then that technology becomes so important. And we also spend um, a long time testing and deciding on which tools to, to choose. But you also have to know that there is no perfect tool. Like every single tool will have its little um, downsides. And um, that's also where the facilitation again becomes so important. And also the motivation of the participants because there will be moments over and over again where you have to kind of like break through those little frustrations of how oh, this isn't working and why isn't this integrated in this? And you have to kind of like keep moving on and getting through those um, uh, barriers. So just relying on the tools again, um, I think wouldn't work. Um, would you, um, Karina has asked a very interesting question and I'll put it to both of you. Let's say tomorrow uh, there's a magic cure and everyone goes back to real space. Um, would what you've learnt in the virtual environment um, improve, would you bring some of that back into the real space and would it, you know, to improve what you do? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, I don't think it would necessarily change how we've set up the model, but I think it has definitely informed us as facilitators of what, what is a deal breaker if it can't be recreated and what is, so what is important to the creative participants. What we had assumed we needed to recreate in the virtual space is not necessarily what they wanted to be recreated. And so we thought, um, like I said, lacking the, the big group feeling might be a, a more disconcerting or, or um, make the event less fun, but the feedback is that it didn't. So we, we, we understand better now what motivates our creative participants. And I think that, that insight is really invaluable. I think for us, there's also a lot of little things, um, just like you said, in, in every single book sprint that we do, uh, we learn and we adapt for the next time. Like our, our toolkit, um, becomes bigger and bigger with every single one. But of course, having this sort of uh, uh, yeah, extreme change of environment created a lot of more learning. So the, the overall process is not going to change, but I think there's, there's a lot of little things that we learned um, and also tools that I think we can, we can introduce in on-site sprints and, and facilitation techniques. Um, I think we're almost out of time. Um, thank you both for this. Um, we had some questions. We didn't have so much time for conversation with uh, everybody else that turned up. Maybe um, would you both um, just um, give the URL of your projects and how people could uh, get in contact with you should they wish to? Yeah, so sure. book dash, anything that you want to know about Bookdash should be covered on bookdash.org. It can go in the chat as well. I'll put my email address there as well. Um, and just to say that we, yeah, we, the same way that the physical book dash manual for recreating that is, is online and, and available for anyone, the, we are writing up and still adding to that the learnings and the processes and tools that we use to do a virtual book dash. Um, and we do try and help people to run their own, but that's not our core work. So we'll help where possible um, if you are interested in running a similar event. For those that would be watching the archive and wouldn't have access to the chat, Julia, do, would you like to say your um, email address? Sure. So if you just email team at bookdash.org, that will be the quickest way to get a response. And the site is bookdash.org. Bookdash.org. Yeah. 
Uh, Barbara? Yeah. Uh, I just wrote in the chat, uh, booksprints.net is our website. Um, we wrote um, already a, quite a series of blog posts about our experiences with the virtual sprints and we continue writing those. So you can also find more information on, on the remote work aspect there and about book sprints in general, of course. And um, Barbara at booksprints.net is my email address. Any questions you can always, um, yeah, just send me an email. Perfect. Thank you both. Uh, really wonderful conversation. I, I have the feeling that this could go on for another three or four hours at least. Um, maybe one day. Let's see. Okay. Thank you very much and thanks to the audience. Really nice to have everyone here. Yeah, there's a good turnout. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Bye.